lots of things. Some of my colleagues, I think, are worried, maybe even pessimistic. They see um, still a great focus on identifying things wrong with people and a focus on medication, mm. a focus on coercion. Mm. I, I think things are moving forward. Mm. I think one of the very important parts of that, mm -hmm. very democratic part of it, is the growth of service user movements. Yes. So instead of us, people like me, professionals, talking about what should be done to people, mm -hmm. uh, people who are using services are much more likely these days to be able to say what it is that they demand, what they need, what they want. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is probably the most powerful force. I think a lot of what has happened in psychiatry mm. has been coercion to mm. protect society mm. against people with mental health problems mm. and we're shifting towards me demanding what I want for my son and for my daughter yeah. if things go wrong in their lives, what I want for myself and, yeah. and that's the shift that's happening. Yes. So yeah. I'm optimistic. Mm. I and my colleagues have had lots of critics and it's still the case that people are, especially on social media, saying some very unpleasant things. Um, so I've been called a, a, a nincompoop by American journalists. What does it mean? It's, uh, it's an insulting term for an idiot. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, um, there's a rather wonderful blog by a psychiatrist called Jeffrey Lieberman who used to be president of the American Psychiatric Association, mm. talking about a document by the British Psychological Society, mm. which talks about psychosis and questions diagnosis and questions some of the treatment practices. Mm. And he, he posted a blog where he put on his white coat, which we thought was amusing, okay. and was obviously very angry about what we'd written, where he said that uh, our document might cause people to question their diagnosis and doubt the efficacy of their treatments. And we said, yes, that's exactly <laughs> what we intended to do. So people have been critical, um, oh, I think for lots of reasons. I think that people are critical because for professional reasons. Mm -hmm. So although the issues that we're talking about are fundamentally about ensuring that people get the care that they need, mm -hmm. they're also about different ideas. And while people find a challenge to their ideas a threat, yes. people see it as a challenge to their profession. Um, I find that quite interesting because there are a large number of very critical, very radical psychiatrists mm. who think along the same lines as myself. Mm -hmm. They also get criticised. So it's characterised as an attack on professions, but it's probably not. Um, I think some people feel that they've got a lot to lose. People with power, mm -hmm. people who make money out of the status quo. I think most people are probably well-meaning. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. most people who criticise the ideas that I and my colleagues have been putting forward genuinely believe that what they have to offer mm -hmm. is in people's best interests. And I think they genuinely fear that things would go wrong mm -hmm. if people adopted the point of view that I take. Um, mm -hmm. So I think most of the critics are well-meaning, yeah. but, but I think they're wrong. And I have to say, I think they're unscientific. So on the diagnosis front, mm -hmm. I think that people continue to combine uh, people's experiences into these diagnoses. They continue, which statistically mm -hmm. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. They continue to suggest that there's some underlying pathological process yes. when I think the evidence doesn't support that. And they suggest that the diagnoses will help us predict what happens to people and guide treatment and all of the evidence is that that doesn't happen. So I think that they're not guided by science. And when it comes to treatment, again, I think that the evidence suggests that, for instance, long-term uh, use of psychiatric drugs 
in the words of a recent conference, does more harm than good. Mm. doesn't mean to say I wouldn't use medication in the short term, but as long-term treatments for underlying illnesses, mm. I think the evidence is that they don't work. So I think my, I think my critics, um, I think they're misreading the evidence. Um, I think most of them are well-meaning, but some of them have vested interests, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. I mean, to be honest, uh, what I'm going to say is um, I've set out what, what I believe is, a, like I say, a manifesto for mm -hmm. mental health. Very briefly, that mental health issues generally should be seen as normal human responses to social problems, yeah. not pathological diseases, that we should look at people's individual problems and then respond to them. And we should respond to them mainly with psychological and social interventions. We should reduce markedly our reliance on medication and then some other things. So we should have a social model of care. We should base decisions about coercion mm -hmm. and the use of mental health legislation mm -hmm. on people's capacity mm -hmm. rather than whether or not they have an illness. Mm -hmm. And finally, we need to do something about those social conditions that create problems. Mm -hmm. So we need to work with teachers and social workers to prevent bullying and uh, abuse of children. We need to look at uh, social conditions, unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, poverty, those sorts of social issues, which are difficult for government. More specifically, I mean, one of the things that we're talking about uh, tomorrow is about how to um, set up systems to ensure that people get the type of care that they need. Mm. And I guess there I would have some quite specific advice that I think it's perfectly possible to give clear guidance as mm. to what sorts of interventions mm. are helpful for people in what particular circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea of setting targets and setting expectations for people about what they could expect. Mm -hmm. So if your child was to develop uh, problems, mental health problems, and it can be a range of different sorts of problems. I think it should be clear as to what is the most appropriate response. But I don't think that should be a diagnostic mm. and uh, illness-based response. Mm. So for instance, um, one extreme would be to say, we shouldn't set guidelines here at all. We shouldn't have targets. It, it's not like cancer. We should avoid that sort of an approach. Mm. I find that quite worrying because I think um, parents, people are unsure of what they need, they, they, they rely to an extent on professionals to, to help guide them. Mm. So I want some guidance and I want to know that the care that I'm receiving is the best quality care. Exactly. But I don't want to be told, so for instance if my daughter uh, began to harm herself, cut herself, mm -hmm. you know, many people do, it's mm. not uncommon. I would want for myself mm. and for her, and I would want those caring for her mm. to know quite clearly what sorts of interventions are helpful. Mm. And I'd want to know that she would get those interventions very, mm. very quickly. Mm. I wouldn't want her to be diagnosed with uh, borderline personality disorder and then treated for it. Mm. And at the end of the treatment, to be told that she's had the treatment and that's the end of it. Mm. So I think you can specify what to, what to do, you mm. can identify people's problems mm. and you mm. can set up ways of assessing whether or not people have got the help that they need in a timely fashion. Mm. But I think that's uh, a million miles away from diagnosing people with illnesses and treating them. Psychologists are often criticised for saying it's very complicated and we don't know. But mm -hmm. I think people can develop um, psychotic problems for a whole range of reasons. So mm -hmm. first of all, these things lie on a continuum. Many of us, not all of us, but many of us have psychotic experiences from time to time. So some of us very, very infrequently and... Um, we barely remember when we do. Some of us have 
some quite weird experiences quite a lot of the time. So some of us have some very unusual ideas. Um, mm. When you talk to people, I was talking to somebody in, uh, in a bar in France who was telling me how he believed that uh, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, were putting heavy metals into aeroplanes mm. and that the condensation trails of, of transatlantic aeroplanes were sowing heavy metals in order to keep the population unintelligent so that we wouldn't criticise the status quo. Mm -hmm. And then we got on with our drinks. So unusual mm. beliefs mm. and even unusual experiences, mm. uh, they're there. Mm. Some people have very distressing experiences. Mm. And I think we do know a little bit about why they occur. Um, so especially there's a, a neuroscientist in uh, Maastricht, Jim Van Os, who talks about um, how uh, social threats make people scared, mm. how uh, when we're developing, how we can develop a sense of being under social threat, especially if you're exposed to racism or bullying, mm. that that can interact, especially with street drugs that mm. affect our dopamine systems, which mm. seem to be associated with the experience of threat. So you can build up pictures for why people would become particularly uh, paranoid if there are certain experiences in their lives and maybe certain vulnerabilities that they have. Mm. We know a little bit about how uh, people's response to traumatic events, especially childhood sexual abuse, mm. can make people more likely to hear voices. And then we know a little bit about how when people do experience voices, the different ways of responding to those voices mm. can make them more or less likely to return. So we know quite a lot about oh. paranoid thought, mm -hmm. we know about hearing voices, we know that they're quite common, mm -hmm. we know they lie on a continuum, and we know some of the processes that make these psychotic experiences mm -hmm. worse for some people than others. Mm -hmm. I guess one of the things that that says is that for me, even though it's relatively common for people to hear voices and have unusual beliefs at the same time, mm -hmm. I think we should understand these phenomena as human psychological phenomena. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. many uh, are scared, even if you say the, uh, the word psychotic. Yeah. A, a, a man or a woman was in uh, a psychotic state, you know, yeah. did horrible things. All these things the mass media tells us. Absolutely. So. And so for me, you know, nothing in what I've said is quite the same as we know what causes schizophrenia. These are experiences that people have and we can trace the reasons for having these experiences and why they can become problematic for people. Mm. Um, and we can also think about what's helpful for people when they are distressed by these experiences. Mm. So I guess I, I don't believe that psychotic experiences hallucinations, delusional beliefs, uh, thought disorder. I don't think that these problems are inevitably a simple consequence of trauma. Mm. It's usually the case that people have experienced trauma mm. and maybe they have some other vulnerability factors. Maybe there's some experiences in their lives that have made them vulnerable. Mm. Maybe the way in which they've learned to respond to stressful events has put them at more risk either of experiencing psychotic phenomena or being distressed by them. And they're very real problems for, for many people. Mm. I just don't think it's a question of looking for the etiology of the disease of schizophrenia. I think mm. it's understanding why people hear voices when there isn't anybody there mm. and why that can be distressing for some people and mm. quite benign for others. I think I honestly think it's different for different people. Of Most of my colleagues would say the best way to treat the way, the best way to improve, maintain and protect our psychological well being mm -hmm. is preventative, to make sure that we have decent working environments, that we look after our relationships, that we protect children at school, mm -hmm. that we have I was going to say the Nordic social model, but we have a more <laughs> humane social structure. Um, mm. We need to look out for people who are being bullied, either at school or at work. Mm. We need to uh, be considerate and even generous towards people who are uh, out of work or impoverished. 
Um, so prevention is the most important thing, and especially I'm very concerned about, personally I'm very concerned about bullying. Mm. I'm concerned about abuse, but I'm also concerned about bullying. Mm. We shape our relationships, we shape our sense of self mm. as adolescents. So I'm very concerned about the way in which our children develop their sense of who they are. Mm. So the first thing, what to do with people is prevent it in the first place, look, look after our children better. That's the first thing. Mm. I think when you're confronted with somebody who is very distressed, um, well, it's difficult. I, I have to say I wouldn't deny people medication, but for me, I think that as an immediate response to somebody in great distress, you know, I, I am a clinical psychologist, I think some of the psychological therapies are very helpful, and mm. I think to sit down with somebody and to talk to them about mm. the sense that they're making of the world, mm. the conclusions that they're coming to, mm. and the reasons why, in a sense, they've, they've learned to see the world in a very distressing way, and mm. to try to turn that back, mm. that would be where I would start as a psychologist. Mm. But I'd work with other people as well. So we need people in healthy communities. So I think we need to work with uh, occupational, therapists, social pedagogues, social workers, mm. so that people are in supportive communities, that people have friends, that people have support around themselves. Mm. So I guess it's a package of psychological and social care. Mm. Um, if it were me, personally, mm. I'd probably go for cognitive behaviour therapy, uh, schema-focused cognitive behaviour therapy. That's mm. my treatment of choice, mm. but it's, it's not for everybody. Okay. Yeah. I don't know any mental health professional who doesn't believe in as, as low a use of compulsion as possible. Mm -hmm. And all of us believe that if we make um, ordinary services mm -hmm. more compassionate, more welcoming, more effective, mm -hmm. and if we help people come forward earlier when they're distressed, then things could be prevented. Mm -hmm. But equally, you know, it does get very difficult. I mean, I don't believe that certainly in my lifetime, we're going to see a situation where we never need to mm. use mm. the powers of compulsion. Mm. The first thing I would say is when we do use uh, mental health legislation, we mm. should use it when people can't make decisions for themselves. Mm. So at the moment, in, in most countries in the world, mm. you can take away somebody's right to make choices for themselves when you think they're ill. Mm. And I think what's very important for me is that we should care for people if we know that they're, or believe that they're unable to make decisions for themselves. So I would base mm. the use of mm. compulsion on a person's capacity. And even if people are making what I believe to be foolish choices, and even pe if people are distressed, if they can make decisions for themselves, I, I think we should respect that. So the first thing is, that's, that's where I would draw the line. Mm. Not that I would use compulsion if somebody is ill, but I'd use compulsion if a person is unable to make decisions for themselves. For me, that's both the legal and the moral mm. way in. And I guess, you know, I, I think that, that there will be many times, certainly mm. in Norway and Great Britain at the moment, mm. where it is appropriate to use compulsion. Mm. Where if we didn't uh, force somebody to go to a place of safety, they'd be in very great danger. Mm. However, I, I also think that, that that doesn't necessarily even then have to be a hospital ward. I mean, mm. I'm aware that whenever we use compulsion, we're in real danger of abusing people's human rights. Mm. But I'm very taken with um, some of the work coming out of the open dialogue approach. Yes. And certainly in New York City at the moment, they're setting up a uh, project, called mm -hmm. a parachute project, parachute okay, project yeah. mm. and the idea there is that um, in many ways they'll work similar to traditional psychiatric services mm. so if somebody is in great distress mm. if the people caring for them or the police believe that they need to be in a place of safety mm. then that will happen mm. but it will be a safe house based on social principles rather than a hospital ward yeah. mm. so if you think about what people need mm. if I was 
uh, in great distress, mm. unable rationally to think for myself, mm. and I was determined to harm myself, mm. I think you should stop me harming myself. Mm. Yeah. And mm. you know, we need to think about all of the physical and training issues that mm. follow from that. Mm. But I don't think the fact that you would need to look after me would mean that I therefore need to be in a hospital ward. Mm. We, yeah. we could be in a... Mm. Could be in a safe, well-designed, well-resourced unit that's based on social rather than medical principles. And I think that's important mm. for two reasons. First of all, because I do fundamentally believe these issues are they're, they're psycho, psychological and social issues that have medical aspects. Mm. They're not primarily medical illnesses that mm. have social consequences. Exactly. Mm. But also, I think for the person involved, mm. I think that's important. Mm. I think that it, mu it must be horrible. I, I've never been detained under the Mental Health Act myself, but it must be horrible for that to happen. Mm. And I think it would be uh, terrible under any circumstances to have your freedom of choice taken away from you. Mm. But I do think the idea of also saying to people, you're ill and you're going to be forced to take medication is very different from saying, you know, we're going to look after you until you're able to make decisions for yourself. So, mm. so yeah, I would, I would use many of the um, principles that we've learned for caring for people who are in great distress and yeah, I would still, I think in my ideal scenario for the future, use legislation to help care for people who aren't able to make decisions for themselves, but to be on the basis of their capacity to make autonomous decisions mm. themselves. Mm. Mm. And I'd use a, a social model of care rather than a medical one.